Good evening. On behalf of the American Academy, it's my pleasure to call to order the 1,956th stated meeting of the Academy. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> it is indeed an honor to welcome all of you here tonight uh, for a meeting of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Boston University is proud to host with the Academy this lecture by Jonathan Cole, a distinguished leader of, the, of American higher education and a member of the Boston University Board of Trustees. First, I have the privilege of introducing the Chief Executive Officer and holder of the William T. Golden Chair of the Academy, Leslie Berlowitz. Dr. Berlowitz began her tenure at the Academy in 1996. Before that, she was Vice President for Academic Achievement at New York University. Since her appointment as Chief Executive Officer, she has greatly expanded the scope and size of the Academy's research programs, increased the number of publications, and established new collaborative relationships with other institutions. She is the co-editor of several books and journals, including Reflecting on the Humanities and Deadliest, and Restoring Trust in American Business. Dr. Berlowitz, please. Thank you very much, President Brown. A couple of weeks ago, I was having dinner in a restaurant across the street from here, and the waitress said to me, are you from out of town? And I took a deep breath and I said, well, yes. I'm." She said, where are you from? I said, from Cambridge. <laughs> it's, it's very nice to see here both Canterbridgeans and Bostonians together, and a great privilege to be here at BU. Thank you for inviting us to collaborate and to co-sponsor tonight's program. President Brown's vision for this institution, his thoughtful and concerned style of leadership, and his emphasis on the dual mission of teaching and research have had a profound impact on this university and on the city of Boston, and I think we should all salute you for that. As many of you know, Bob is also a distinguished chemical engineer who came here from, the other si from that other city across the river. We are also proud that he's a member of the American Academy and pleased that Boston University is one of the university affiliates of the Academy. Since the end of World War II, American research universities have been recognized as among the leading institutions in the world. Our campuses have been the coveted destination of the brightest students from around the world. Whether they've stayed here or they've returned to their own countries, they have created new knowledge, new industries, and helped to propel the U.S. economy. In recent years, there has been growing concern about the international predominance of American universities. For example, the share of science and engineering research publications authored by Americans is on the decline falling from 34% to 29% in the decade between 1995 and 2005. And I keep looking over at our speaker because I want to be sure that my data is correct because there's no one who knows the data better than he does. Similarly, between 1970 and 2005, doctorates awarded to Americans in engineering declined 23%, in physical sciences by 44%, and in mathematics by 50%. According to data recently compiled by the American Academy's own humanities indicators, of which Professor Cole is one of the progenitors, um, the nation's uh, share of post-secondary degrees awarded in the humanities is behind a half dozen other countries. The fact that American universities can still continue to attract among the best graduate students in the world is, of course, a sign that our institutions are still perceived as of the highest quality. But as other emerging economies invest heavily in their university systems, will we be able to keep these students? Will we be able to thrive? Our speaker tonight has thought deeply about this problem and has focused his distinguished career both as a scholar and as an academic leader on these problems. Jonathan Cole is the John Marshall Mason Professor and Provost and Dean of Faculties Emeritus at Columbia University. His tenure as Provost 
there from 1989 to 2003 is one of the longer careers in that kind of position in America. Uh, today, uh, if a provost lasts five years, everybody says, gosh, he's, he was brave. He did a great job. It is a, one of the most difficult jobs in higher education. He is highly regarded for his perceptive leadership and for his astute handling of town-gown relationships, among others. Jonathan has been an eloquent advocate for academic freedom and for the idea of the university as a central institution in America. He has a remarkable ability to get things done. I ran into a dear friend and colleague of both Jonathan's and mine in New York yesterday and told her that I had the privilege of introducing Jonathan tonight. And she said, you're so lucky. He's just the best person in the whole world. That's spoken by the senior vice president of the Mellon Foundation and a member of the department that Jonathan very much grew up in. His academic work has focused on the sociology of science and knowledge. And his scholarly uh, activities have included important work on peer review and on the role of women in science. He has been groundbreaking in this work and written numerous articles uh, about and books about this subject. Tonight, we're very privileged to have Jonathan reflect with us on the concepts that he has advanced in his most recently published book, The Great American University, Its Rise to Prominence, preeminence, its indispensable national role, and why it must be protected. In this volume, he has offers a very cogent analysis of the contributions that research institutions make to our society and the challenges that they face right now. And I know many of the trustees of BU are here in the room tonight, and we all applaud you for contributing to this important problem of preserving and advancing America's research universities. Jonathan has said that he was motivated to write this book by the realization that many people simply don't understand or appreciate what our world-class research universities are designed to do. He has provided a compelling description of what these institutions do and why that matters for America's future. It is my honor to welcome to this podium a fellow of the American Academy, a trustee of Boston University, and a leading public intellectual. Also a mentor and friend, Jonathan Cole. It's great to be here uh, in Boston, across the river from Cambridge, um, and it's about a quarter to seven, and I thought this was all going to begin at 6.30, which reminds me of what my piano tuner once uh, told me uh, when he uh, came to tune my piano. He happened to be the last person who toured with uh, great pianists, and in this case it was Rachmaninoff. And uh, Rachmaninoff was a very punctual person. He liked to begin his uh, concerts on time, and he was giving one in um, out in the outskirts of New York, and they told him that the concert was going to begin 20 minutes late. And he turned to uh, my tuner, Bill Huffer, and he said, Bill, he said, we're going to uh, begin 20 minutes late, but I can assure you we're going to end on time. <laughs> uh, no one had ever heard Mozart played quite that way. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank uh, very much uh, Bob and Leslie for putting this together. It's a great honor to be, uh, to be here. And I want to, uh, to talk a little bit and highlight about a few features of great American universities uh, that are elaborated, I must say, at uh, much greater length in this, uh, this book that I recently published. So let me begin. I, I think it's fair to say that when most educated Americans think of our great universities, they don't think that lasers, FM radio, Magnetic in imaging, resonance imaging, global positioning systems, barcodes, the algorithm for Google, the fetal monitor, the nicotine patch, antibiotics, the Richter scale, buckyballs and nanotechnology, the discovery of the insulin gene, the origin of computers and of bioengineering through the discovery of recombinant DNA, had their origins at American research universities. 
Nor do they uh, think, I believe, that improved weather forecasting, cures of childhood leukemia, the pap smear, scientific agriculture, measures of surveying public opinion, the concepts of congestion pricing, human capital, the self-fulfilling prophecy, all had their origins as well at our research universities. And I dare say that even the electric toothbrush, Gatorade, the Heimlich maneuver, and Viagra had their origins at these great universities. Now, most people among the educated public think of these universities in terms of undergraduate and professional education, in terms of teaching and the transmission of knowledge rather than the creation of new knowledge. Now, this point of view is completely understandable. They are concerned about the education of their children, their grandchildren, and to relate it to their own experiences in education. But what has made our universities the greatest in the world has not been the quality of our undergraduate education or our ability to transmit knowledge, as important as that is, but our ability to fulfill one of the other central missions of great universities, the production of new knowledge through the discoveries that change our lives and change the world. Now, in my book, I wanted to tell the story of how great these great universities became the greatest engine of innovation and discovery that the world perhaps has ever known, how this has been achieved in a relatively short period of time, and how they are today, in fact, under threat. Those are the three parts of the book, and I'll try to address aspects of that in this talk that will end in time for you to have questions for me. Look, there is a major point I want to make at the very outset, and that is the teaching of undergraduates and graduate students is critically important and an integral part of the mission of great universities. Some of this is done very, very well, others in a less distinguished way in our universities. But the fulfillment of undergraduate teaching mission is not what has made our great universities the best in the world. Now, why do I say, and I use the term, best universities in the world? Well, what evidence do I have? Of course, there are wonderfully creative scientists around the world and other places, but the United States, over the past century, has produced an abundance of them, more than at any other place and any, in other, any other nation. Now, of course, we have surveys that uh, have been done, and we have uh, a variety of, um, if you will, rankings that have been done. And in these rankings, generally speaking, 80% of the top 20 universities in the world are from in the United States, 75% of the top 50, and perhaps 60% of the top 100. We can quibble about those numbers, but Henry Rosofsky, who's here tonight, many years ago made the same basic approximate uh, ratios, and they still hold today. There is other evidence uh, of course, for the preeminence of American universities. Today, for example, there is not one German university in the top 50, nor, by the way, one Russian university in the top 75, unless they do their own rankings. <laughs> uh, and the Chinese universities, by their own accounting, I must say, don't have any in the top 200. Now, the other evidence, of course, is also, for example, symbolically in the receipt of Nobel Prize, where 60% of all Nobel Prize winners uh, in science since World War II have gone to Americans or foreign nationals working at American universities. And if you look at the most cited literature, and I think Leslie's quite right that there has been an indication of a downturn in the proportion of total literature, but if you look at the, the most cited literature in the world, it still is dominated by American scientists and scholars. In fact, American universities have become the envy of the world and because many of the very, very brightest and most able young people throughout the world want to attend them and work at them, they represent collectively perhaps the only American industry today that has a favorable balance of trade. Well, let me tell you uh, a little bit. Uh, this is a long story, and it's, as you've seen from out there, it's a thick book. But in some ways, it seems to me that some of the central themes and messages of the book can be summarized fairly easily and quickly, which I'll begin with just that summary, and then I'll try to elaborate further on them. 
First of all, contrary to what most people think, this is an amazingly young system of research universities, embedded, highly embedded in the dynamics of the larger American society. As I'll say in a moment, the origins of the American research university doesn't go back to 1636 with Harvard's opening or Yale's opening or Columbia's opening. We tend to think of them as these old great universities, but it really goes back to 100 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence when Johns Hopkins was opened in 1876. So these are relatively 20th century institutions and their growth can be really traced back fundamentally to uh, the last quarter of the 19th century. By the 1930s, I argue, a core set of values of the system were already in place and upon those values were built a series of structures that have worked very, very well once they were established. And I set the critical point, if you will, for the beginning of the takeoff of these universities to begin in 1933 in January, and then really taking off uh, after the Second World War. A second element which was critical to the growth of preeminence was a remarkably enlightened post-war science policy, probably um, the best science document and policy in the history of this country, certainly, and maybe in the history of any nation. I want to talk a little bit about that and the impetus that this growing distinction and preeminence of our universities uh, resulted from, to some extent, that policy. The discoveries I've already began to signal you have made a huge difference in our lives. And, however, I want to also emphasize that these great universities are rather fragile institutions, and they periodically come under attack, and I believe to some extent they are threatened today. I do want to talk about that as well. So let me begin with the rise to preeminence and elaborate a little bit on these uh, central messages. As I said, in the beginning, as it were, the great transformation took place in 1876. And Hopkins was built out of a hybrid model, basically, that was, uh, was based upon the travels of many of the early educational leaders in university life in this country, that is to say, early uh, in the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, who traveled uh, to Germany and to England and were extraordinarily interested in the educational systems that they found there. Many of them fell in love with the German educational system. And in fact, the American system became a rather hybrid model of an amalgam between the German system that emphasized advanced research and the British system that emphasized undergraduate colleges. But in many ways, uh, the American system improved on those models that had existed elsewhere. For example, it was a much less rigid and hierarchical system, much more democratic in its organization and structure than the German uh, system. In fact, many of the great uh, scientists and scholars who came from the German system when they finally migrated in the 30s were, would remark upon how open the system was in the United States, we would have students actually talking to professors using their first names and volunteering to contribute ideas when not necessarily called upon. So it was an open and much more democratic system and it was far more um, open to opportunities than the British system uh, early on in the 20th, uh, 20th century. Now, the idea of this university, this new kind of university that was fostered by Daniel Coit Gilman, the first president of Hopkins, began to attract the interest of real scholars and would-be scholars in the United States. It became fascinated by Hopkins and what it was trying to do. And Gilman, who was not uh, adverse to trying to recruit stars from other places, set his sights on places like Harvard and others, and began to recruit from those places. Charles Eliot, the great leader uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century at Harvard, had said earlier on about uh, the Hopkins uh, and the German system of higher learning that it would fit Harvard freshmen, quotes, about as well as a barnyard would suit a whale. Well, as the competition rose, and as he began to see that he might lose great faculty members to places like Hopkins, the model at Harvard began to change, as it did elsewhere. 
And that began to set off a great deal of interest in this new, this new kind of university, this new kind of model. Now, along with uh, the experiences that these leaders had with the German and European systems, there were other factors that contributed greatly to the early uh, movement towards the new university model. First of all, there was a growing belief in the latter part of the 19th and early 20th century on the fruits and potential of science and technology. The federal government became involved with universities. In fact, during the Civil War, when Lincoln was able to pass and Congress passed the Morrill Act of 1862, in which land-grant colleges began to be formed and made an act that actually gave the possibility for establishing state universities, land-grant colleges, and research stations that had a great deal to do with the revolutions in agriculture in the United States, and done during the Civil War, and probably only done because the southern states were not represented and therefore couldn't filibuster uh, against the, the act. Now, there was also the emergence of organized academic disciplines. At the, at the end of the, of the 19th century, people like Eliot, as presidents of the university, or p people like Nicholas Murray Butler, they would make decisions on their own. And as the breadth of knowledge grew, it became more and more difficult, if they were honest, to be able to assess the value of this work. So many of them embraced the growth of disciplines and the idea that they could, in a sense, hand off the decision-making about what determined and what actually was quality to a set of peers in those academic disciplines. All of this led uh, to a social compact between society and these universities. The government, on the one hand, would provide resources and remarkably autonomy from government control. And you, one has to really think about that. I don't have the time to go into that. But when you think about the government giving resources to universities, expecting certain things from them, but trying to stay out of their business, it's a remarkable thing that few other uh, spheres of uh, university life in other nations have been able to achieve. The universities, on their part, would provide more skilled and well-trained labor that would prepare people for more highly skilled jobs, better educated citizens who could participate in the democratic process, and discoveries that would change our lives. Now, these great universities began to embrace a set of core values. In my book, I talk about a dozen of those, but here I just want to mention, really, and that's all I have time for, really four or five that were central, and which in many ways had their earliest formulation in the Enlightenment and the growth of scientific knowledge in England, for example, in the 17th century. Now, I want you to know that these values are represented as ideals. They are not necessarily totally approximated. To this day, they're not totally approximated. But the values in included the value of universalism or meritocracy, that is that individuals should be judged on the quality of their work, not on the basis of any ascribed characteristics such as gender, nationality, social origins, or race. A second core value is organized skepticism, which is the incessant questioning of claims to fact and truth. And being open to radical ideas, but very conservative about the methodology that would be needed to demonstrate the fact value of those ideas. It also embraced the idea of free and open communication of ideas, secrecy or prior restraint and censorship, and privileging certain kinds of knowledge was the anathema to an open system of communication on which knowledge could be built. And then another core value was free, free inquiry and academic freedom, which should not be viewed as a privilege but as being at the very foundation of great universities. It's essential for releasing the imagination, challenging established orthodoxies, and prevailing views in science and society. It lies at the very heart of the way universities are organized to create their own criteria of excellence, independently of government or external political ideology. Some nations still have not learned that that's a necessary condition for greatness. And then there's the peer review system and a variety of other core values that I discuss in greater detail. Now, it wasn't only a matter of values, 
There were other elements that went into this production of a new system and a growing system of quality. Exceptionally talented people were brought into the system from wherever they might be found, anywhere on the globe. Enlightened and bold leadership existed and was extremely important in the early years. For example, in the foundation of uh, the formation of the University of Chicago in 1892 by William Rainey Harper with using Rockefeller's money, in short order, it didn't take more than a decade for uh, Harper, who was an incessant recruiter of talent and had a wonderful truffle-dogging ability to sniff out uh, talent and to recruit them through Chicago, had made the University of Chicago into one of the top five universities in the United States, research universities. And then there was Elliott and Gilman and Andrew Dixon White at uh, Cornell, Nicholas Murray Butler. And then they handed this over to another set of extraordinary leaders that came by in the 1920s and 1930s, and I include among, among them um, Hutchins and Conant, and I'll say a little bit more about them. But another critical element beyond the leadership was a high level of autonomy from the state and a very, very strong belief in competition. Competition has played an extraordinarily important role in the development of quality in American higher education. One might argue that it's become problematic to the point where we have too much of a good thing and we're suffering institutionally from hyperexis of uh, too much competition. But if you want to look at the origins of academic free agency, you can go all the way back to the formation of the University of Chicago and what was happening there in terms of the beginning of incessant competition for uh, uh, outstanding talent among the universities. And then, as I mentioned, after World War II, unprecedented vast resources were put into this system to help build excellence. And it came from a source that had much greater potential than any private philanthropy could or private foundations could. Let me just mention that two people who championed the core values that were extraordinarily important was Robert Maynard Hutchins, who I believe was the greatest champion of academic freedom and uh, free inquiry in the history of American higher education. Um, he defended it against the Broyles Commission reports of, uh, the, during the McCarthy period when they wanted to uh, pass legislation in Illinois that would make it unlawful for a communist, a member of the Communist Party or a former member of the Communist Party to teach in the public schools or the University of Chicago. He gave them nothing short of a civics lesson when he testified to them and brought the whole commission to its knees and basically that was the end of the legislation. And he was the beginning in many ways of that tradition that still exists at the University of Chicago that believes essentially that universities are places where there must be totally open and free inquiry and a great respect for ideas where a meritocracy of ideas should exist, not a meritocracy of ideology, which is of course uh, contradiction in terms in itself. And then there's James Conant, who in many ways, I think, was one of the champions, among other things that he did, of meritocracy. And it, was, it wasn't as if the idea of meritocracy didn't exist previously. For example, Cornell was opened with a much broader sense of meritocracy, of inviting women in and minorities in from the very outset of, Corn of Cornell. But the transformation of Harvard, after it had basically purged itself of its undergraduate population of Jews and set quotas from a point where there were 27 or so percent of Harvard undergraduates who were Jews in the, in, in the 19, late 19 teens and early 1920s, uh, uh, and then became a, a quota in effect uh, for many years. It was really um, Conant who opened up the idea that regardless of your means and regardless of your background, if you had talent, Harvard wanted to recruit you. It wanted to recruit the very best regardless of these background characteristics. These people uh, were set the universities on a path in which these values were not only reinforced but became essential to uh, the development of the, uh, of the system. Now, I had mentioned earlier that I locate the inflection point for the greatness of American universities in January of 1933, and uh, why do I do that? It, by the way, it would be a mistake to think that there wasn't, for example, in the 
teens in the 1920s, a growing body of very, very able young physicists, for example, in this country. We weren't devoid of physics talent, but we had a lot of young talent, the kinds of people represented with I.I. Robbie and others at, uh, at uh, Columbia, who were there, they were traveled abroad, they understood what was going on and fascinated by what was going on in places like Germany, and they came home and they were in need of leaders. Well, they got that, and they got it uh, in the early 1930s uh, because the German university system completely caved in after Hitler came to power in January 1933. And you remember that March, the laws have changed, but in March, uh, the, the Constitution has changed. Uh, Roosevelt comes to power in uh, the presidency in March of 1933. By April of 1933, Hitler had purged on ideological and religious grounds the great leaders of the German universities. And much to the surprise of many, like Fritz Haber, who had converted to uh, Christianity and thought he was immune, given all of what he had done for the state, as it were, during the First World War and, and uh, at other times. Well, the tragedy of Germany, which was a catastrophe for the German universities, was uh, for the American universities a great bonanza, if you will. We were the great beneficiaries of the intellectual migration that took place and followed. Just get a sense of the kinds of people that were coming from Germany during that period, some of which you may know and some of which you may not know. But first of all, 50% of the theoretical physicists emigrated. 25% of the pre-1933 uh, particle uh, physicist community uh, in Germany uh, left. Had to leave, of course, if they could. But here are some. Albert Einstein, Leo Szilard, the great, uh, the great physicist who became interested in biology. Max Delbruck, also, who is probably considered the father of molecular biology. Paul Azesfeld, the soci sociologist. Hans Bethe, Enrico Fermi. Um, Theodore Adorno, Thomas Mann, Bertolt Brecht, Mies van der Rohe, Bella Bartok, some came from Hungary, some came from Germany, all those affected by what was going on. Sigmund and Anna Freud were late leavers, but they had to leave as well. Now, this provided the American system with new leadership, and it was interesting how the Americans handled this. They didn't simply take these people and distribute them depending upon where they wanted to go. The physics community, for example, decided well, where can we best place these people, given what they are doing, to maximize their potential as leaders of the people who are already there in this young system of, uh, and community of phys physicists in the United States? And so, for example, Hans Bethe was more or less assigned. You know, it wasn't an assignment which was compulsory in, in the old German fashion, but he was asked whether or not he would take a position at Cornell, even though he was going to be part of the traveling seminars which met in New York and other places. He did, and it was particularly appropriate that he did so because they needed that kind of leadership. So a new chemistry developed, and an extraordinary chemistry. We had, on the one hand, horizontal mobility of the emigre scholars, with the, and that was mixed with the vertical mobility, increasing vertical mobility of new American academics, many of whom had Jewish backgrounds and, uh, and came from poor backgrounds rather than uh, privileged ones. Okay, so if there was this infusion of great talent, there was also something else that made a huge difference, which I also alluded to earlier, and that is the science policy which came after the war in the form of a manifesto, perhaps you want to call it, certainly a phenomenal document called Science, the Endless Frontier. That was authored, basically, by Vannevar Bush, no relation to the Bush clan of, uh, of more recent hi history, an extraordinary en engineer at MIT who was instrumental in the development of the, the war effort of scientists uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the war period. In fact, it's interesting, if you, if you ask people who Vannevar Bush is, uh, knowledgeable friends of mine, uh, very well-educated friends of mine, and you, um, and you ask them who James Conant is, if people who've gone to Harvard and may know the, the history of their presidents would say, well, they know of Harvard, 
Um, and they know of Oppenheimer a bit because Oppenheimer was involved with the bomb, and almost none of them have heard of Vannevar Bush. And yet Vannevar Bush, perhaps, in terms of the history of science policy and the influence on universities, more important than either of those men. But what was in this document, Science, the Endless Frontier, which made it really a revolutionary document? Well, here were just a few of the elements. And by the way, it was uh, Roosevelt who asked Bush to, to do this. Well, it wasn't really Roosevelt. Roosevelt asked a question, and a good question. What would happen to American science and engineering and technology after the war, after the scientists had gone from Los Alamos, uh, discouraged by, in some sense, what they had achieved, gone back to the university settings, wanting to get, get away from big science, because this was the first huge scientific enterprise that was organized in the, in the nation, what would happen? And Vannevar Bush, his advisor, said, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be a complete disaster. So uh, Roosevelt said, well, let's do something about it. And Bush then took this up. He asked, uh, by the way, four questions. It, it wasn't a Jewish holiday, but it, he asked four questions about what we should do. He had committees that were uh, assigned the various tasks, but he basically wrote the report, and it was basically his idea. And here's what some of the elements contained that were prescient, brilliant, and extraordinarily consequential. First of all, he believed that there should be a creation of the National Research Foundation, which would be an independent organization that would fund fundamental research in this country after the war, that it should be endowed by the government, and that it should uh, be independent, autonomous, and uh, support great science and engineering, uh, but particularly pure science, where possible. That morphed, and I won't tell you the story, it's in the book, into uh, the National Science Foundation, which was formed in, in 1950. Uh, uh, Perhaps even more important than that, although the NSF has a great history, is in that he argues cogently for the use of public taxpayer money to, to support fundamental research through our universities by essentially outsourcing rather than state controlling the growth of knowledge. That was very different from the European experience and the European uh, way of doing things, but extraordinarily important for our universities and I believe for the growth of knowledge itself. He also believed that this outsourcing and the measure of quality should be determined by a peer review system that would determine quality. He argues very much for the link of research and teaching missions in the universities and laboratories. We often forget when we talk about the teaching mission, we talk a lot about undergraduate education, but we don't talk about the, the non-curricular, formal curricular teaching that goes on at universities in graduate laboratories in graduate work all over the place and quite extraordinary efforts. Not only these graduate students uh, contributing to the growth of knowledge, but there is very, very close interaction and teaching that's going on almost continuously. That's a very important part of the American system which differentiates it from many of the systems around the world. Uh, and there were a set of other elements, but I, uh, I am not going to go into them uh, here. Let me just juxtapose what also happened after the war in terms of leadership and the necessary conditions for leadership, and then I will move rapidly to the threats and uh, spend a little bit of time there and then entertain some questions. I want to juxtapo juxtapose two leaders that were turned out to be provosts um, between 1957 and 1967 and 1968 one of whom I believe is the greatest provost in the history of American higher education, with all due respect to Bob and his, his, his years and, uh, and other great provosts that I've known. And, uh, and, and that was uh, Frederick Terman uh, at Stanford. And I want to contrast him with somebody from my own university, Jacques Barzin, who is a terrific, phenomenal intellectual historian. Well, Terman, I want you to know, was a st networks even existed then, and they were very important. He was a, st a student of Vannevar Bush's. He ran the, uh, uh, the anti-submarine 
laboratory uh, efforts at Harvard during the war. He was really, he, he bled, if you will, um, I guess you would have to call it now Stanford Cardinal Red or something. But his father was there, the great inventor of IQ testing and, and the like. He went back to Stanford and he spent the rest of his career there. But he went back after he had actually run an organization that had more people on it during the war than was in the size of the faculty at Stanford when he went back to Stanford. But he, he saw the future. He envisioned how universities were going to grow and are going to be, were going to be reorganized and restructured. And what he did was he capitalized on that. And how did he do it? First, with Wally Terman, the president of uh, Stanford, they moved the medical school from, uh, from San Francisco to uh, the, the Stanford campus in Palo Alto. Why did they do that? Remember, this is in the late 1950s. It was about three or four years after Watson and Crick's discovery of the double helical form of DNA. And he realized that medicine was going to be linked in the future to genetics and biology. And so the biological sciences should be linked and coupled very, very directly with medicine and its applications. That turned out to be a huge, huge success, although it was very, very costly. For four buildings, it cost $12 million. And they were trying to figure out how to raise, uh, raise the money. But once they got this going, Terman was an extraordinary recruiter, and he, was, uh, he knew that there was going to be increasing relationships between industry and the universities, and he was going to build up engineering, he was going to build up the sciences that he knew most about. He was going to allow the creation of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences that would bring in great social scientists that could be recruited by Stanford. But how did he do his recruiting? He was clever as hell. He was a member of the National Academy of Sciences uh, at the time, and he wanted to get extraordinarily young people and good people, bring them in in bunches, and he wanted to get them on the cheap. Well, how did he go about doing this? He had, he had access to the ballots of all the young people who were being nominated to the Academy, and he looked for all those that just missed the cutoff line and who didn't get into the Academy, and he went after those. And he knew about how their quality was. He knew that he could potentially recruit them. He did. They eventually got elected to the academy. They were huge leaders from you know, people who were already in the academy, like Josh Lederberg and others, many of whom won Nobel Prizes. But he understood the way the wind was blowing. Now, juxtaposed to that, uh, my old colleague, uh, Jacques Barzin, who is, as I say, a great scholar, but who in many ways wanted to return to Cardinal Newman's university of the 1850s. He wanted universities to remain sanctuaries of a certain kind. He wanted them to be cloistered enterprises. He, saw the, he, he understood what was happening with the government involvement with the, the research university, and he didn't like it. And so rather than see how the wind was going to blow, there was basic resistance at Columbia to the development of these ideas, and a stagnation in many ways for a period of years of the growth of laboratory life and trying to uh, link that up with industry and the like, which was total anathema to Jacques. Well, you know, one has the result of being uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, Terman wasn't the, didn't originate the term, but he did originate on campus uh, the work of uh, Hewlett and Packard, for example, and gave them some space in one of his garages in order to build the first, uh, the, the first elements of that company. And from that grew enormous, uh, an enormous quality and steeples of excellence at, uh, at Stanford. OK, let me just suggest to you what the economic aspects of all of this is, that we often don't uh, and don't really attend to. There are f actually too few universities that look at, in any systematic way, the economic impact on their local communities, their states, and the nation. Stanford, as you might expect, does. And uh, the university reported in 2008 that faculty members, students, and alumni have founded more than 2,400 companies, a subset including Cisco Systems, Google, and Hewlett Packard generated $255 billion of total revenue among the Silicon Valley 150 in 2008. MIT also does this, interesting two universities, uh, very interested in science and engineering. This kind of economic impact at MIT can be seen in its offspring as well. It reported in the same year of 2008, 4,000 
approximately 4,000 MIT-related companies that employed 1.1 million people and have annual world sales of $232 million, a, a billion dollars, a little less than the gross domestic product of South Africa and Thailand, which would make MIT companies among the 40 largest economies in the world. And that is not counting the multiplier effect, if you, as you're familiar with. It's not only the companies, but the services to those companies and all the jobs that that uh, creates. University of California system spends $5 billion a year in research. Okay, so there we have it. Now, we are, I believe, at the moment, the greatest system of higher learning in the world, especially at this level of elite uh, quality universities. So what are the threats that I'm talking about, and why do I perceive that there are threats? Well, let me uh, try to talk to that and speak to those challenges and threats in the time that remains and then have some questions. The first thing that many people think about as far as threats are concerned um, is foreign competition, global competition. Uh, they perceive the Chinese, the Europeans, others, um, becoming competitors with us and overtaking us. I don't think that's imminent, although I should say that they have enormous, enormous potential. Uh, and a lot of it uh, is unrealized potential because they have enormous human capital or the potential for building extraordinary human capital. And in, in Europe, it's, it's there. But what are some of the problems that do exist in these nations? First of all, in the European nations and, and Asia, often these are state-controlled systems with the absence of competition, and they have state employee mentalities, the professoriate, which is not true even in the state universities at the, in the United States. They have set up systems of internal competition with their own universities. For example, the Grande École in France has far more prestige than the universities. All the elites in France want to send their kids to the Grande École, the École Normale Supérieure and the École, Normale, the École Polytechnique and the other Grande École. And they, they really don't care that much about what's going on at the universities. And in Germany, for example, you have this juxtaposition between the Max Planck Institutes, which are run by the central government, and then the state-run universities where the Max Planck Institute professors don't teach. They are not, they're not involved with teaching. They have better salaries, resources available to do research, et cetera, et cetera. So this internal competition doesn't help them. Uh, the flow of talent is outward at the moment. It's a structurally rigid system. It doesn't allow young people to change uh, their, um, their foci of attention uh, when they're interested. There is the separation of the research and teaching missions of these uh, universities. For example, the CNRS, which is viewed as the equivalent to our NSF and NIH, but not really, um, happens to have a system in which if you're hired at the CNNRS, let's call it the NIH, you have tenure the first day you step into your laboratory. There is no form of real accountability or review of quality. There are many people who I'm told at the CNRS who run businesses on the outside while they hold their appointments at the uh, CNRS. It's very difficult also to create reform in these, uh, these societies. Okay, there's another aspect of this which is equally important on foreign competition. We shouldn't fear it. Foreign competition would be good for the American system, it seems to me, and it would be very good for the growth of knowledge. If we have an expansion of the number, the size of the set of great universities in the world, we may not have 80% of the top 20 but we will have enough if we maintain our quality and expand on that. But we'll have other universities contributing to the growth of knowledge, to finding cures for diseases, for advancing uh, the welfare of their people in ways that we should feel very good about and which will be transferable, hopefully, uh, across national boundaries. So I personally don't fear this, uh, and I don't think it's imminent as well. So where are the threats? Well, to paraphrase from Walt Kelly's wonderful cartoon character, Pogo, who some of you may be familiar with, I think it was begun, I think the strip was begun in 1948, uh, the, you know, when, when McCarthy was beginning to feel his oats, or certainly the McCarthy period was here. Uh, and, and Pogo once uh, said, he said, we have met the enemy and he is us. 
And so I believe, in fact, that the enemy is us. And what form does it take? Well, it takes multiple forms in the United States today, and they worry me. First of all, there's the intrusion of ideology and the government into the research processes of the universities. During the McCarthy period, during points of national crisis, national strain, whether it be um, around the First World War and the question of entry into the, uh, into the Americans into the First World War, there were uh, professors who were against the draft, who spoke out against the draft, and who were fired. Tenure didn't hold much force at the time either. Of course, during the 1930s and 40s, during the, uh, the, the Red Scares, uh, and, and certainly earlier, uh, also there were firings. And, but one of the interesting things that has happened is that the recent attacks on the universities are not only issues around speech and academic freedom of speech, but on the research mission itself and how that can undermine the mission. And let me give you a few examples. The anti-terrorist legislation, which, uh, which we passed in 2001, 2002, the USA Patriot Act that you're probably familiar with, and the Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act, have in them ways in which uh, they influence and can, can curtail scientific research. There are what we call um, you know, select agents that uh, biologists and chemists uh, work with that are toxins, viruses, bacteria that can be very lethal, and there ought to be controls on them. They need to be controlled. These are, these are nasty things if they were to, uh, to get outside of the laboratories. But the ways in which this act allows the government and the FBI to intrude on the research activities of scientists has become extreme. The case of Thomas Butler is an interesting one. He was uh, perhaps the nation's leading, one of the nation's leading immunologists working on plague. He had transported the bacteria from, for 25 years from Tanzania. He was uh, working on antibiotics that could perhaps prevent this or to be used and could be uh, used against potential bioterrorist acts. He had transported uh, these materials to his laboratory for 25 years. He did the same. Um, he uh, was I'm going to make a very long story short. He was arrested for violating the Patriot Act. He was indicted on initially something like 16 charges violating uh, transport and other uh, provisions of, of the act. And then the FBI came into his laboratories, searched all of his, uh, his lab notebooks, all of his tax records, and they added 50 uh, additional charges to him. Eventually, he was fired from the university. He was, um, despite the, the jury exonerating him from all of the charges, but one very minor charge having to do with the, with the Patriot Act, he was convicted of tax evasion and other things, which sent him to jail ostensibly for nine years. It was later reduced to a two-year sentence. He, was, he had to pay the university $250,000 in fines. In any event, the consequences of these kinds of actions, which are very little known in the wider public, led Robert Richardson, the Nobel Prize winner at Cornell, uh, to talk about the effects of this act on research at Cornell that dealt with select agents. Before the Patriot Act, Cornell had 38 laboratories working on the diseases and the scourges that were possible uh, by the, um, the use or proliferation of these select agents. And after the act was passed, and after two years and experiences like those of uh, Thomas Butler, there were only two labs left at Cornell that were doing research on select agents. And he said, we've got a lot less people working on interventions to vaccinate against smallpox, West Nile virus, anthrax, and any of uh, the 30 other scourges. So these, uh, these anti-terrorist legislation have, in fact, inhibited the production of research, including, for example, if you happen to be a student from Iran, which is labeled a, t uh, a country supporting terrorism, and there is not a scintilla of evidence that you're a security risk, you cannot as much as walk into a laboratory that is doing research with select agents without placing the leader of that laboratory, the faculty member, at risk of being criminally indicted and punished. 
And, uh, and consequently, they are beginning, that is to say the government is trying to tell people who they can have as graduate students and who they can hire uh, and the like. So they're intruding themselves into the research process. Well, another major factor that many people have read about is restrictive visa policies. We produce so few science and technology uh, uh, majors in this country, or let's say certainly not enough uh, to staff both the K through 12 programs as well as certainly colleges and universities, that we are uh, in jeopardy of losing the source of great, great talent which has come from ab abroad. In fact, as you probably know, I think there are only 15% of high school physics teachers who are actually certified to teach physics in this country. All the rest are being taught by people who have no certification in physics. There have been efforts at prior review and potential restraint on publications of biological papers, which violates that deep principle of open communication. There's increased surveillance, which has gone on in our libraries by outside um, investigators where people can look at library records, computer files, etc., without showing or having to show probable cause at all. And there are gag orders on those uh, who allow these searches. In other words, librarians can't tell people that they are the object of actual investigations. Okay, there's also, external to the universities, the politicization of science, if you will, and the, the re-surfacing, um, as is periodically the case, of anti-intellectualism in America. And I'll just give you, just tick off the things which are known to you. We've, we're just in the middle of the next saga on, on research on embryonic stem cell and whether or not we can uh, develop new cell lines. Global climate research, the, 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 the efforts by the government to censor and doctor scientific reports by people like Jim Hansen, one of the great climatologists in the world, efforts to muzzle him from giving talks because his views differed from the official policy and ideology of the Bush administration. There was the taking down of the CDC websites on reproductive health and HIV, which um, you know, said that condoms uh, can help prevent uh, HIV from spreading, uh, and they returned instead of uh, the, uh, this idea uh, a dramatic uh, effort to try to get abstinence uh, being used as the only way of uh, preventing this spread. The peer review system has been under attack. There's been efforts to make political appointees into the national peer review committees, et cetera. There's been efforts to curtail academic freedom in a variety of, of ways uh, during this period of time, uh, uh, trying to attack scholars who have points of view which are not uh, dominant and which go against uh, American foreign policy. Okay, um, if there are a set of threats from outside the university, we also must be mindful of the threats which exist inside the university. And I just want to go over a few of them which I think are deeply problematic. Well, you know, one which straddles, uh, really isn't inside the university, but which is worth mentioning, and then I'll answer questions about it if, you, if you'd like, is the possible dismantling of the great public universities in this country. And when you think of the University of California, and it probably is the greatest system of higher public education following the 1960s uh, report of Clark Kerr and the California model that has ever really been produced, providing both access, opportunity, and research quality in one system. And yet, this system is being starved at the moment. And, and, and if it gets starved sufficiently, no one of these legislators in California seems to be truly appreciative who are voting for this kind of thing of the cascading effects of this starvation project. And what do I mean by that? If they begin to lose faculty members because we're recruiting them. I mean, after all, we're very sympathetic to the situation and the plight of Berkeley, but we're out there as vultures trying to really recruit them or the, or, or the best of them, and we're willing to pay a lot more then they're getting paid at, at Berkeley and offer them great lab facilities and the like, library facilities, et cetera. So if they lose those great uh, scholars and scientists, they're apt to lose great graduate students. If they're apt to lose great graduate students and scholars, they're gonna lose federal research money and other forms of research money. They are going to have, in, in my mind, actually poorer teachers as well, 
and they won't have the spin-off companies and all the other kinds of things which have, are influential and potentially far more influential in the future in terms of uh, the, uh, the way in which knowledge at universities will lead to innovation and new companies and, um, and new jobs, uh, high technology jobs in the local economy and the national economy. California, of course, is not alone, but the, the thing to remember is, and these legislators don't realize, is that it's infinitely harder. It is really infinitely harder and far more costly to rebuild lost excellence than to maintain it. And once it's lost, it's going to be much more difficult to reclaim it. But the universities themselves, as I say, are not immune from all of this. And here are just some of the issues that I think are problematic for us to face within our universities. First of all, the issue of the commercialization of intellectual property, the erosion of the norm of disinterestedness. I mean, you know, 100 years ago, uh, scholars and scientists believed that they shouldn't profit from their discoveries. Well, that norm has been completely eroded. And in fact, many universities, most of the great universities, are fostering uh, the use of intellectual property for uh, a variety of very good productive reasons for the society, uh, following the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980 and 82. But there are potential hazards, real conflicts of interests that we have been exposed, that are there potentially and actually. And the question is, how do you reformulate a balance that reinforces the norms that are essential and the core values of the institution while still using the intellectual property in a way that, as it were, is good for the society and is good for the common. That's a problem that we face. Um, another problem is that we have at the universities today, even our greatest universities, those that foster open, an open, free discourse and a real marketplace of ideas, we do have a herd of independent minds. And that is there's a tendency towards extreme intellectual orthodoxy in our universities. There are certain things that we just have to admit really cannot be talked about openly, at the great, even at the great universities. And it's not only that there's resistance to these ideas on the social and political and humanistic levels, where we hear most about it, or where there are, can be arguments about social policies in nations abroad, whether it be the conflict in the Middle East or elsewhere, but it even goes to the sciences where there are resistances to new and radical ideas and orthodoxy tends to hold forth. The truth is that there is not a huge amount of intellectual courage in American universities. There's not a great deal of intellectual courage anywhere but we don't have a superabundance of it. We don't have a monopoly of it at universities. And um, there isn't the impulse, as Max Weber said, to recognize and to teach inconvenient facts or possible facts. That troubles me a great deal. There also seem to me to be problems with a structural imbalance that is required for innovation and greatness and excellence. And that is that some of the old structures that we have at universities that have been in place for 100 years are becoming fetters on the growth of knowledge. Knowledge is growing in ways that is much more rapidly than the adaptations in universities to produce structural change that will allow for the free explosion of this knowledge. So that, for example, there is movement towards in interdisciplinary work, but the silos that are and the, and the, the, the uh, the sense of control and power that's locked up into individual schools, departments, et cetera, et cetera, increasingly produce fetters on the growth of knowledge. And the question is, can we adapt, as any organism must adapt, to environmental and other kinds of changes? Well, uh, I'm going to stop here. There are a bunch of others, if you'd like me to go into, that I can talk about, including, I believe, one of the problems is that the rich are getting richer in this country, not only in the general population, but in universities. And the question is whether or not, if you, if you project out 50 years from now, and you have universities, let's say five or ten, five universities in this country, that have very substantial endowments that basically double at the same rate as everybody else's endowment, let's say seven to ten years. Just think of what it will mean. Let's Harvard's endowment took a big, big hit, and it's sort of off the table. But let's say it's 23. Maybe it's now closer to 30 billion. Maybe it's come back a bit. Let's say it doubles 
in uh, seven to 10 years and it becomes 60 billion. And Columbia's is at seven billion and it doubles to 14, 120, 28. Eventually that disparity becomes real in its consequences, very real in terms of are the great universities and ones which don't have anywhere near the endowments of Columbia, Pennsylvania, MIT, Chicago, or BU, are they gonna become simply farm systems for a handful of universities that will become the Oxfords and Cambridge, and maybe occasionally uh, you know, Imperial College London, where there will be an absence of real competition, especially in the high-priced, expensive fields. What do you do to prevent that kind of skewing of wealth? And it's an extremely difficult problem, because I want to say I'd be absolutely against any form of taxation, even in the Ivy League, I can't quite imagine that would be, be sharing of revenues uh, among, the, um, among the various schools. I mean, as bad as our football program is at Columbia, I don't think Harvard's interested in giving us money to improve it, uh, aside from laboratory and work and, and the like. So uh, let, me, let me conclude, and, and I want to, by the way, in, indicate that while I believe that the President Obama, in some sense, gets it and understands universities, it's a big difference. There's a big difference between getting it, having been part of the Chicago University culture, beliefs in the Oval Office, and being able to do anything about it. And thus far, frankly, I've been very disappointed in what he has actually been able to do or has been willing to try to, to do. So the jury, I think, is very much out on, on what Obama will do for these, uh, these universities. Certainly nothing has changed with the anti-terrorist uh, legislation. In fact, in some ways, it's gotten worse. And there are other ways in which the stimulus package was great, and one shouldn't look, look a gift toss in the mouth. But after all, after all that's one-time funding. It's not base funding. He didn't solve the problem. The fact is that the, age, the average age of the first R01 grant for a uh, researcher in the medical and biomedical sciences has reached about age 43 before people can operate independent laboratories, independent for their mentors. Those things have not been attacked, and they really need to be if we're going to remain extraordinary and strong. So anyway, let me end on a, on a hopeful note, however. I, I think there's very good reasons why the United States should be able to maintain its dominant position among preeminent research universities. I also believe there continues to be enormous unrealized potential in the system. And when I talk about threats, I'm not only talking about absolute threats, I'm talking about the threats to slowing down the rate of improvement in these universities and in what they can do. So it's the slope of the line I'm interested, even if it continues on an upward trajectory. Uh, and that would be unfortunate if the slope were to, uh, to move towards the horizontal. We should not fear foreign competition, which I believe is not imminent, but once it emerges, will actually be good for the international system of higher learning and good for the growth of knowledge. But there are, in fact, choices to be made. We're capable, I believe, of blowing it. And if we follow the path being taken by many states in dealing with their great universities, we may well lose the luster that we have. That's the great test that we face, and it remains, for me, an open question whether we'll pass it. Thank you very much. I, I know it's late, and I prevented you from having dinner at an earlier hour, but I'd be happy to take uh, some questions from uh, people who remain and uh, are interested in asking. Yeah. Behavior. If you take, I'm sorry. So uh, I was saying that the American bureaucracies <laughs> administering science, they had become older relative to when I was young. You know, take the, the Atomic Energy Commission and you compare it to the Department of Energy, and they are fascinated by the European bureaucracies. The European bureaucracy can engage on big projects, big science, and so more effectively, even when they are meaningless, than the American bureaucracy. So I think this is a very serious threat, and we see it in our own life. 
Well, I mean, I think the bureaucratization of the university, not only in terms of big science or, or almost global science, uh, is, uh, is also an important problem that we face. Uh, there has, there's been a set, really, of palimpsestic trends in the, the development of universities. The adding on of bureaucracy after bureaucracy after bureaucracy, and the bureaucracies are linked to interest groups. And as they are linked to interest groups, who are stakeholders in the university, it becomes increasingly difficult for the leaders of the universities to take this very, very large tanker and move it almost in any direction. Uh, because in one way or the other, there's going to be opposition to almost any idea that they have. So the bureaucratization and the change in scale of the university are uh, important issues to confront, and they represent threats, to, in my mind. David? As a physicist, I'm delighted that you chose to take many of your examples from my distinguished colleagues. Oh, it's because you were here, David. <laughs> ah, well chosen. But as a provost, I'm also concerned about the uh, social sciences and, and humanities. And I wonder if you could speak briefly to the challenges there. Let me just give a hint to what I've been thinking about, the disastrous role of critical theory in English departments, uh, such as uh, your former yeah. uh, English department. <laughs> Well, um, it's still an English department. Um, let me say that in this book, I think that I did something which was basically strategic, but, uh, and strategic for the audience that I was trying to reach, which was if I want to make, as it were, a case, which I think a legitimate case, and I don't mean just arguing without facts, uh, to the American public about the value of these institutions for them, uh, pointing to the kind of demonstrable and instrumental and even utilitarian consequences of the university makes the case easier, quite frankly. And it's harder to say, look, there's a priesthood uh, or a set of rabbis that you should support, you know, that don't have any, you know, haven't changed your life in any discernible way that you can think of, uh, but which are critically important for the university, as I think they are. And I believe that the humanities are extraordinarily important for the university. I do talk a bit about it in, in the book, but it not, not sufficiently, really. I actually don't believe that we can deal with um, the sensibilities of human beings, the values that we have, the, the, the growth in values, our, our own uh, sense of making moral and ethical and other kinds of choices without dipping deep into the humanities and having experience with the kind of education that comes from the humanities. And increasingly, even in large-scale science projects, as you know, they have philosophers and they have uh, ethicists and other people who are actively engaged in, you know, in some of the problematics that come out of nanotechnology and nanoscience. And, and when I was in China uh, working on um, a wonderful project of, which was to create a world-class university from scratch and to create a blueprint from it. When we finally got the blueprint uh, in front of some of the people uh, who were very, very smart, they said, well, you know, can't we do without the humanities? Um, or, and by the way, what's your field, uh, sociology? Oh, God, we could get rid of sociology. They're just troublemakers. Um, and why not? Because they were interested in science, technology, and they were going to have an industrial park right next door, you know, to be, have the fruit, use the fruits of that. And I said, I don't believe you can have a great university without having the humanities, the arts, and the social and behavioral sciences in it, and very well integrated into it. Um, and, you know, I, and I think that's underplayed in the, in the book, quite frankly, but uh, critical to the, the success of any, any enterprise that, uh, that is seeking greatness. Back there. Thank you for a stimulating lecture, Dr. Cole. As a proud alumnus of some of the larger endowed universities, including Boston University and University of Pennsylvania, and an alumnus of some of the potentially farming schools at the University of New York, I'm a little alarmed when you talk about the schism between the large endowed schools and the smaller endowed schools. And I hear your comment about Obama and how little he's done in the educational realm. I believe this week he named uh, the historically black schools as a key segment that he wants to invest in. How do you think the role of those schools play in Obama's interest in the future of education? 
Well, I mean, I think supporting uh, those schools are, are very important. For one thing, they, it turns out that a great number of their graduates uh, have a higher probability of going on to graduate school and becoming members of faculties and the like. Uh, and, it, and, and look, we're becoming a society which is increasingly diverse, uh, increasingly uh, going to have, uh, in many, many states and in the country as a whole, may well have a majority of its population that uh, have origins in, in uh, parts of minority groups. And if we don't begin to educate, train them, bring, the, bring them up to the same levels of everybody else, and there are disparities that, that exist, um, we're going to face you know, even mounting problems, especially in areas of science and technology and the development of that. So it's not that I'm, a, uh, I think it's, you know, to support these colleges is, is fine, but I think you need a much more bolder and grander plan for how you're going to sustain the quality of American uh, universities and how you are going to, you know, there's a, there's a very interesting book by two economists at Harvard, um, Claudia Golden and uh, um, Katz, um, Larry Katz, uh, which is called The Race Between Education and Technology. And the, the central message of that book is that one of the reasons why we grew the way we were is that we were much more open to social mobility and education in the United States than they were in Europe. And we began to educate more and more people who finished high school and then went on to college and finished college, preparing them with the skills that were necessary uh, for the kinds of jobs that would be created with uh, high levels of technology. Now, we have now lost that edge against the Europeans and other nations uh, who have opened up their system significantly, and it's not clear that we have any substitute in the K-12 through area, as well as in many of the undergraduate programs around the country, to, um, to ensure that we have a labor force, which was part of the thinking of Vannevar Bush and Science the Endless Frontier, that will be equal to the tasks in front of them if they are going to be living in a knowledge-based bound society, which is what the 21st century is going to be. It's a deep, important issue, and it's not being adequately addressed. I think these are elements of trying to address some of it, but you know, throwing money at it is not necessarily the end uh, result. I mean, it's not going to produce the results you want either. You made brief mention of uh, the period post World War II that being especially enlightened time for uh, educational policy. I wonder if you could just say a little more about the elements of. Uh, of that policy that you thought were, were so good and, and whether there are elements that uh, would still be very useful today? Well, I, you know, it's interesting. If you look at the work of historians of, of education, a lot of them muse and go back and they talk about the golden age of higher education being the 1960s. And this was the aftermath of Sputnik, the infusion of huge uh, ramped up increased federal expenditures and research and other kinds of things. First of all, I don't believe in golden ages. I think that they are almost invariably <laughs> illusory. But the interesting thing is that as they talk about what was going on that was so extraordinary in building up science and technology, laboratories and resources, they forget to mention that the campuses were a wreck. You know, that they were being torn asunder by ideological disputes, the, the war in Vietnam, and all this was going on. And, you know, for, for those of us who were doing demonstrating and things like that, it was sort of an interesting time as undergraduates. But the fact of the matter is that these campuses were not, you know, um, systems with great harmony uh, where everyone was uh, sort of uh, uh, joined with common values and common objectives and all the rest of, of that. So I, I actually think that while the policies that were represented in the post-war science policy were instrumental over the long run in differentiating the American system of higher learning from many others which existed in the world and had an enormous positive effect on their growth and quality, I don't think that it ended or was particularly uh, present in the 60s uh, you know, and, and didn't continue, continue on. So, the policies were set in motion, but I don't think, um, uh, you know, that they were determinative of some golden age, for example. Let me take one more question, and then we'll, uh, we'll have to call it 
uh, call an end to this. I'm sorry we didn't have more time. I guess I, I, guess I didn't use Bill Huffer's uh, and Rachmaninoff's uh, edict uh, sufficiently well. well. Thank you. I, I'm privileged to have the last question. Uh, and David somewhat stole my thunder on the, the humanities question, but I have another uh, question. Um, and I guess your book is partly uh, in response to this, but I'm curious as to why you think universities have not been able, the great research universities, whether they're public or private, you know, here in Massachusetts, Uni University of Massachusetts is under assault, why they have not been able to get the word out about the, whether it's a, a, a strictly utilitarian benefit that they are bringing to, to our culture or you know, in, the, in the humanities. What, what is it that uni universities have just not been able to get across to the broader public, the broader educated public who are not necessarily involved in university life? Uh, and, and, and what can we as university uh, people do to, to make sure that the, the broader public is, is really aware? Because I think that, that there's a real disconnect. Your book is, is addressing that. And just, why is well, it I, would, I would hope that the message there? that gets out and that we all begin to uh, realize has to be sent to many people who lack uh, an understanding, not out of ignorance, not out of uh, any kind of ideological conviction, uh, that that message has to be sent by many people. Now, the, the, the interesting question is why have there been so few leaders of American uh, universities uh, that have been able to do this? And, and I think there are many, many ways from literally the 17 hours a day that they work solving immediate problems. I mean, this, this disaster or that disaster being uh, prevented, uh, I think they get on the, they, they have been placed on the defensive to try to defend the cost structure, for example, uh, of, of the universities. Uh, and they haven't uh, had really the time, uh, perhaps, I, I think they ought to make the time, uh, to begin to make this case wherever they, wherever they can, in whatever way they can, and hopefully uh, that the signal, uh, rather than the noise, is, uh, is heard uh, out, out there. Um, but I do think, and it was part of the reason for writing this book with this particular point of view, that there are a few people out there who really understand, including members of Congress, including members of state legislators, legislatures that, that really understand that if you undermine the quality of these universities, you, you are turning off a pipeline that's absolutely essential for the quality of this nation over the, of the, the it's not a matter of choice in a way unless you want to destroy the upward uh, trajectory of the quality of life in American uh, society in the, in the 21st century. So, you know, you have uh, the American Academy is doing certain kinds of things on this. Uh, we have not been good at articulating in an offensive way what the missions of these universities have, the multiple missions and the achievements of these institutions, rather than playing defense against things that are highly esoteric about indirect cost recovery and, you know, and the claims that we are abusing these things, or always about some kind of conflict of interest case that comes about. So in some sense, what we have, we have failed to do is realize the, what Alfred North White had called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. We focus on these trees on a day-to-day -day basis, and we don't give people the broader picture of the, the nature of this, uh, this forest in which these trees are embedded and uh, how it's important to preserve the forest. Anyway, thank you very much. The 1,956th stated meeting of the Academy is dissolved. Good.